Hello and welcome to the third episode of our Fundamental Principles Communist Production and Distribution by the Group of International Communists Reading Group Series. Today is Thursday the 1st of July 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. We tackle Section E of Chapter 2, Wage Labour and State Communism. If you'd like to join in the reading group or like extra bonus episodes or creating Discord over in the Discord server, head on over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. This week, I've got the new patron, Paige, and the returning, Ben Hanshu, to thank. Okay, let's get back to work. Uh, welcome to today to the third Fundamental Principles Reading Group series. Today we are doing Section E of Chapter 2. This is Wage, Labour and State Communism. That's from page 44 to 54. I am still suffering from a cold, so I'm going to look for a reader. Anybody want to uh, volunteer to read the first bit of a section? Slavic Dreams, let's go. Let's hit it. Uh, Section E, Wage, Labour and State Communism. Firstly, it is important to realize that production based on the value of the labour force, i.e. wage labour, can never lead to anything other than disenfranchisement of workers. The reason for this lies not in the badness of the state administrators, but in the laws of movement of the system. The crucial point is that there is a contradiction between the value of the labor force and the work that the worker delivers daily to his boss. We are never paid for our work, but in exchange for our work we get as much as is necessary to maintain the necessary livelihood. With our wages, we take every week several goods from the market in which, for example, no more than 24 hours of social work is involved. In reality, we have worked 40, 50, 60 or more hours this week. We give to society in this way more than we get from our wages is called extra work, which then represents a surplus value for the owners of the means of production or the state. The lower the wages and the longer the working day, the greater the surplus value that goes to the state or the capitalists. Mistakenly, there is a widespread opinion that the creation of surplus value is good in itself, but that this surplus value should not belong to the owning class, but should be returned to the workers by the communist state through social legislation. This view is wrong because it does not consider the social importance of wage labor. We have already pointed out that there is a contrast between the value of the labor force and the day-to-day work. The peculiarity in that the amount of work we give to society has nothing to do with the number of goods we take from the market through our wages. In other words, There is no direct connection between the wealth of goods we produce and our wages. The worker does not determine his share of the product through his work. Not our work, but the value of our labor force determines which part of the wealth of goods we will receive. Yeah, so here we notice here that he's kind of introducing a term that we haven't had before, I don't think so far, which is... The value of the labor force. Okay, now you see from this here that he's very particular in not calling this the same thing as it's called under capitalism. Like he's not calling this labor power, you know, the value of your labor power. He's given it a different word, but it's essentially the same concept. I I think he wants to keep away from these kind of distinctly ones that are like capitalist terms that are used by Marx to develop to explain capitalism. But he's trying to kind of abstract away from the implementation of it in capitalism. I assume that that is not really just a translation issue. I assume that he's tried to keep these terms distinct. So anybody have any anything to say here about this idea of the labor, like the labor force and the wage. Okay, we had hands up there from Alex. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I assumed it was the, the value of labor power as well, and just, you know, the, the difference in power and force was just a, a, a translation. He doesn't do anything to suggest there's any distinction that I can see. 
confusingly, occasionally he ret- refers to that concept as value, which doesn't help, but um, we can really figure out what they mean. What a question, if we go to it, is the there's no connection between the wealth of goods we produce and our wages. I think it's a bit of sleight of hand going on there. I mean, there clearly is a connection. You just invert the formula for surplus value. You see a connection between the two. What there is, though, is, is the work of not having control over the degree of surplus value. But the, you know, later on, they'll be introducing a similar concept when the, there's work done for, for the common good. Yeah, that's fair enough, because there definitely is a relation. You know, I think it's more of a hyperbole more than anything there. Yeah, I, I think it's more than hyperbole. Well, I, I, I think it's more than hyperbole, to be honest. I think so what, I, I think he does use that point later on. So having asserted that, I think he does use that, that assertion later on. We, we, okay, we'll get there, yeah, and we'll, uh, we can pick it apart as we go. Okay, we had a hand up there from Chris first, and then Kielce. We can't hear you, Chris. Let's try Kielce. There was one paragraph in here that, that's really interesting. I think it's the, the number that mistakenly there was a widespread opinion that the creation of surplus value is good in itself, but that this surplus value should not belong to the owning class, but should be returned to the workers by the communist state through social legislation. And what's really interesting there to me is I, I don't understand how you how you get rid of surplus value. I, I can see how it not being given to the state or the you know the factory or the, or the, or the, or the, or the, or the management at all. Just uh, but I, I I don't understand how you get rid of it completely because I I would have think you know even even in an agrarian economy you, you have a surplus and that's that's your grain for the next year and in, in, in and in a communist society your surplus is, is taking care of the young and the elderly or or investment in new equipment. So that's that I'd like I'm looking forward to seeing explored more. I that, that, find that paragraph interesting. Well, like w- with agriculture, like you can have a physical surplus. So a physical surplus is different than a, you know, a surplus value. The general idea of surplus value would be that this is the way I understand this paragraph is that you are producing stuff, a surplus, which has been alienated from you to other people. And they decide on what to do with that surplus, even if they give it back to you. And I think that's the, the way in which he's using surplus value there. Like even if you had a communist state that redistributed everything fully back to everybody and there was no exploitation you would still have this surplus value going to the state and the state giving it back and what he's going to build up is a very different approach whereby you are get the full value of your labor and then there is an amount that everybody agrees to society agrees to a level of which we need to support everybody in society you know your this is the gsu units we're going to get to now that may feel like a a kind of logical distinction but in reality what happens when you have a bureaucracy deciding what to do with the surplus you end up in a situation where exploitation becomes a kind of a fact of of life that they're able to decide on the structure of society in a way different than the workers deciding it themselves i think that's the the general gist of how they mean that also, Illuminatus in the te- in the chat has said that in the German edition it just says Arbeitskraft, which is usually translated as labor power. So, so that's interesting. So maybe they weren't trying to have a different term. Alan S would like to speak. Um, yeah, on this whole labor force versus labor power thing, it would make sense to me if it was just another word for labor power, because uh, if I remember correctly, uh, Marx kind of thought of labor power as a force of nature. So that would be equally applicable to any like mode of production if it's a, a force of nature that's inherent in, in humans. Also on the, uh, this bit about creation of surplus value being good itself, but just redirect through the you know, communist state. I think the issue there is like, like the, what we're trying to do here is kind of get past value production in the first place. So there's no surplus value if there's no value, right? Because we're not doing commodity production anymore. I think that that's the point that he's trying to get to. I think I think it's probably I think it's probably both, Alan, I'd say, that the method in which society itself decides upon on how to say have a communal spending, how to redistribute its own stuff that the method of, by which that is done is extremely important. So I, I would say that, yeah, I, I think that's both. Chris, do you want to have a try then? 
I can't hear you, Chris. <coughs> Still nothing. No pressure on Chris, but this better be good by the time he does connect. I know, this is it's fucking, the suspense here is killing me. Okay, so I think we'll just continue on. Let's take it from where we dropped off. From the point of view of the wage earner, his share of the national product is thus practically a blow to the air. His wage will fluctuate around the value of the labor force, but he will have to fight for it, regardless of whether it is a capitalist or a communist state. Because facts speak better than gray theory, we will demonstrate this later in the light of the Russian experience. The peculiarity that the amount of work we give to society has nothing to do with wages is much more important than the question of distribution alone. This means that the wage earner has nothing to do with the social product. It is an expression of the fact that the producer is separated from the social product. It means that the producer has nothing to do with the management and administration of the social production process. This is the essential meaning of a production in which the labor force is paid based on value. It also means social antagonisms within the working class, social antagonisms between the workers and the red directors of the factories. It means the struggle of the workers against their state. The value of the labor force is the bearer of all these conflicts. This is because our work does not determine our relationship to the social product. The workers who believe that a communist revolution is only about passing on the surplus value of the owner to the state are therefore deeply mistaken. Basically, the workers want to rearrange their relationship to the social product in a communist production. And they think that they have built a new relationship when they exclude the capitalist from the surplus value in order to let it flow to the state. What is actually happening is a new distribution of surplus value in society. But what does this mean for wage earners? There is no new relationship between producer and social product. In capitalism, this relationship was determined by the value of the labor force and in so-called communism also. For the wage workers, therefore, the goal of the proletarian revolution can only be to establish a new relationship between the producer and the social product. For the proletarian, the goal of the social revolution can be no other than to determine through his work at the same time his relationship to the social product. This means abolition of wage labor and work is the measure of consumption. It is the only condition for putting the management and administration of social production in the hands of the workers themselves. Okay, anybody want to come in and comment on this stuff? Except for Chris, he's not allowed to comment. Alex. Yeah, this the, the this long paragraph just before it kind of makes the point I was saying before. You're saying that there's no new relationship. So Okay, under capitalism, you get a percentage of the value of the work you, you produce. At the end of this book, they're going to suggest the same thing. You know, under capitalism, who de who decides, like, what the actual percentage is? No, you're right. Okay, so it, it's the, the difference is having control of the degree of exploitation. I don't think you would even term it exploitation, you know. I, well, like, okay, I Excess work, whatever. The, 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 surplus. The, the extra work, but whatever the, whatever the, the ratio of is total work divided by, like, your work I receive. Yeah, like, I, I think, like, I wouldn't go so far as to say that the, the old exploit the young, as in, just, like, so we can think it through a wee bit, like, it's, so it's like, because we all get old once, so, you know, so we'd all be getting the benefit. So say, like... In that scenario, you couldn't say the old would exploit the young, but like you might, you, you know, be quite harsh and say maybe those with like disabilities exploit, you know, those yeah, yeah, able bodied. I, I, but, I don't really mean exploiting, and that's just, I literally just meant like excess, you know, the extra work. So I think the, the, the kind of the, the, the real reason why it's, it's talking about the wage in this way is because when you have a system whereby somebody else but the worker decides what essentially that taxation is yes you have a system that is not 
communist or socialist because you've broken that link between them and their product. Exactly. But that can control has nothing to do with wage labor in itself. You can have wage labor and still have a fixed like, d- degree, a uh, percentage of extra work. Yeah, like the society could, for example, decide to have our communist tax at the same rate as, say, a bureaucracy could decide it to have it. It could have it, it, could have it higher. It could have it lower. But I think the, ch- the, the actual, the distinction, though, is I think even more than just what the rate of surplus or whatever we're going to call it. Like, as in, when you have a bureaucratic class, the actual relationship between within the factory deciding on production itself changes. So we see that the expression of of a wage actually seems to, in and of itself, introduce value dynamics. Okay, we're going to get to that a little bit later. But I, I would say, like... The fundamental idea of having a top-down bureaucratic, say, people decide on what the rate of surplus or whatever we're going to call it is, that dynamic also will play down through society as in like a structure within the factory that's going to be more hierarchical. So I think like the, it's a totality, you know? That like the very the, arguable point is just not the point they're making, which is that wage labour in itself is the, the responsible for, the, for this dynamic. Uh, well, I, I think I think you just have the two when you have the one, if you know what I mean. Like, it, technically, you can have the same. Like, let, let's think about it. Like, could you have a, a, a society whereby they hand over the control of the surplus to a bureaucratic elite and a society where the factories themselves are flat and horizontal and don't have a bureaucracy deciding what goes on in the relationship within the factory? It it seems to me that like that would to be it would be in an extraordinary society to have its, its dynamic. I think that you get you get with a bureaucratic one, you get a top down kind of uh, dynamic within the society. Just that's just it's an expression of that top down dynamic versus the other one where you have you know a flat system and a, not a wage, but the workers deciding their their own rate of say communist taxation. I think they're intrinsically of of a, of a piece. Then uh, I think they should have taken the trouble to write a paragraph saying so. Yeah, I think maybe as we develop the, the argument as well in the book, maybe we'll get, maybe we'll we'll hit on it in 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 that kind of a way. Like what we're getting to here, Alex. This kind of discussion we've just had, I I think is pretty kind of said here in in, in this sentence here. The the value of the labor force is the bearer of all these conflicts. You know, the social antagonism within the working class, social antagonism between the workers and the red directions of factories. It means the struggle of the workers against their state. The value of the labor force is the bearer of these conflicts. Like, I I think that's trying to get to what you're saying. I think it's trying to answer that point, to be honest. So would you say it's trying to say the lack of control over the degree of extra work is the bearer of all these conflicts? Uh, I think it's saying that Basically, a labor power relationship. The fact that there is a, a wage and the wage is being decided by somebody else is the bearer of all the stuff that's going. Uh, uh, Alan, I think, put up their hands. Uh, yeah, it's maybe it, it sounds like a, a technical nitpick or something, but when we say the, the value of the labor force or labor power is the bearer of all these conflicts, that's. I think that's the the core of it, but the reason is because the only the only way labor power would have a value is if it has the form of a commodity and then it's it's exchanged on the market. That's where value comes in. So if we're talking about a society where the means of production is you know held in common by the workers, then labor power can't have a value because we're not exchanging it. It's something that we're deciding to engage according to you know our plan and workers council or, you know, whatever structure they give it coming up later in the book. But the point is we're not exchanging power as a commodity. Yeah, I think that's it very well put. When you are paid by your labor hours, assume there's no taxation. Everybody's paid their labor hours. We have destroyed that idea of labor. The value of the labor force is destroyed. You literally just get your labor time. Uh, Slavic dreams. Yeah, so I think that, not to get in the whole state capitalism debate or the terms there, but I think 
when I had posted on the Discord, that was the primary concern is because you treated labor power still as a commodity, but you didn't necessarily may or may not have produced, say, consumer goods as a commodity. And that introducing, you know, different layers of types of uh, value production. Yeah, like, because in, you know, you know, in the Soviet Union, some of it wasn't commodity production. Uh, there was a mix of commodity and non-commodity production, as far as I'm aware. But they still had that labor power as a commodity. Illuminatus. Um, I have to ad- admit that I still don't quite understand this point about the value form or whatever. Because if you say that like the red state, whether the red state has like a slightly higher tax rate to care for the elderly and whatever, or whether you like have like the value form still operating, that's basically just like the tax rate is a bit higher, right? So by, by um, having this thing, okay, the, the the surplus value goes to the state, basically just means there's like a minimum tax rate. <laughs> no, I think we're going to see, Julian, as we get through the book, we're going to see the different dynamics that, why it's different. There are different dynamics that we're going to see later in this in this very chapter. We're going to see different dynamics that come out of having the wage relation versus not the rela- wage relation. We're going to see it specifically in like, we're going to see with the health and safety of the workers for example, is one thing that's going to come out of it. Yeah, 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 of course. I mean, um, the whole thing like who controls what obviously is very important. But the way I understood the discussion just now was that somehow the amount of like what the tax, the quote tax rate is like somehow played a role. But that's not the case, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, maybe I wasn't exactly as clear as I think Alan was about the labor power no longer being a commodity, being the thing. But like that expressed itself through the workers themselves determining what their commie tax rate is. But that's not the prime thing. Slavic. Yeah, so I guess to kind of maybe clarify a little bit. So I think regardless of, you know, what amount the state picks as, you know, where that surplus value is going, I, I understand the primary force of this conflict being what he says on page 45, where he says uh, his wage will fluctuate around the value of the labor force and he will have to fight for it. So there's a tendency because we're not working in just uh, labor hours that we're working in value that there's going to be a tendency for the state or the capitalist to push down how much they compensate the worker and that this is one form of the the conflict that arises you know whether you decide how much surplus value goes to the you know gets redistributed for other things or not is kind of separate from the fact that there's like this motivating force to keep pushing down how much your wage is your your value of labor right and to to put it as low as possible, that there's like that motivation is essentially kind of removed. Yes, yeah. Uh, Simon, do you want to try it again and come back in? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to, it's more of a general feeling I'm getting. It's on the topic of labor power or labor force or whatever you want to call it. It just put me in mind of, you know, Marx's overall vision of communism as a, as overcoming the division between mental and manual labor. So in a way that when, when you're selling your labor force, you're selling your, basically your brain, mind and muscles, but you don't have a power to direct that. So when you get rid of the concept of labor force, you're basically, well, when you move, when you move to the kind of setup that they're putting forward in this book, uh, in terms of measuring in direct labor hours, then you're measuring work as in self-directed work rather than some abstract labor force, which is completely directed from outside. Yeah, like I think there's definitely an element to that, like where there is not a distinction between skilled and unskilled labor, like people with different talents get the same pay. So there is this break. Like, I think there, I think you're right. There's definitely an element of this is, a, is will, will inevitably lead to some kind of a break between this distinction between skilled and unskilled labor that's in the wage form 
and that it, it would undoubtedly lead to a change in, in that dynamic. Illuminatus, I think, had his hand up again. But whether you say that the worker has no control over his product, whatever, that's, that's of course true under capitalism, but the worker also doesn't, can't control or only in a very mediated way what happens with like the taxes he pays so it's kind of like the same because because of course if you just look at like what happens on the shop floor of course in this like future communist society they try to sketch out here the labor process would be more self-directed or whatever but when you take out some of the quote value to like care for the elderly or whatever like once you have a tax rate that's still a point of contestation so just like the worker would say oh i want to get more value for my work and you have like this conflict between the red state trying to push down how much the workers get so this like whole conflict that we still would have in such a society because value still operates It's still kind of there when you think about it. You could very well have like a red bureaucracy that wants to like have a high tax rate because it like lives off of this. The taxes finance the bureaucracy. Yeah. So, so, it, so it's not necessary. So be, yeah, because like obviously like taxes could be like siphoned off or whatever. So I don't quite get where like the fundamental difference is still. Well, you know, I think Julian, like, a communist society is not going to destroy politics. It will destroy politics in the bourgeois sense, but it's not going to destroy politics or conflict over what, say, society should decide would be a tax rate. But the thing is, is that that would be an open and democratic decision of the workers by the workers. And that's a very different thing than it operates under, say, a bourgeois society, where people essentially have no choice on what the tax rate is. The tax rate is chosen by political parties and even if they if they run on one thing they'll often just do exactly the opposite whatever works for capital like i think you have to really stretch the logic of saying like a bureaucracy deciding what the tax rate is as being the same as everybody deciding what the tax rate is i think that's a push and i'd also say that like in this system everybody gets paid their labor time so a, a bureaucrat working in some maybe in a, in, a, in an area that's highly critical gets the same wage as everybody else and has got no ability to transfer loads of money to or loads of resources towards his thing on his own making decisions. That is a societal decision. So it like the actual logic of how how things would work would be entirely different than capital or say under like a Soviet experiment type society. Kielce put up his hand. Really quickly, I was just going to say that Julian's point is really good. I was thinking along the same lines, but that also something can be better without being perfect, and that can still be a good thing. So, yeah, that, I'm sure there'll still be corruption in, in, in bureaucracies, but I'm beginning to see how this is a, it would be harder under this system. Um, just very quickly, very quickly, maybe we could like summarize that this is necessary, but not sufficient. Like, you could still fuck up the bureaucracy. <laughs> and therefore it would not be like a good communist society or whatever but yeah yeah it's necessary but not sufficient yeah i, th I think it's just like the, the the basics that is required for a communist society is what the argument of the book is how you make your bureaucracy like the fact that we're talking in these terms of bureaucracy like that to me in itself is a sign of of a problem about how we're discussing the book to be honest with you Because, like, un under this system, all workers' councils have equal power based on the number of people that are in them. There's no difference between somebody working in, say, the Foreign Exchange Council with, say, somebody working in the Sewage System Council. Like, they may have be able to have specialities that might have greater impacts, say, on people, but they don't have more power. And, you know, what determines a bureaucracy, you know... Like, people don't talk about the sewage bureaucracy in the same way as they talk about other things. Like, the nature of us reading all this book as well, I would say, is that we, we will be having these arguments. And as we get through the book, I think we'll be dealing with some of these arguments and we'll maybe be working ourselves th through 
why we think there is a difference. I don't know if I'd go so far as to say it's uh, necessary but not sufficient. You know, I, I don't, I'd have to think about that, Julian, to be honest. Okay, let's go for the next section. Who wants to get, read a bit of this next bit? Patrick. When the Russians began to operate production based on value, they proclaimed the expropriation of the workers from the means of production. And they proclaimed that there was no direct connection between the wealth of the goods to be produced and the share of the workers in the social product. All capitalist elements thus crept into the economy as soon as value and surplus value resumed their ordering work. It is the secret force that works everywhere, cannot be grasped concretely anywhere, that controls social life with an invisible hand. That is why Lenin had to sigh. The machine refused to obey the hand that guided it. It was like a car that was going not in the direction the driver desired, but in the direction someone else desired. As if it were being driven by some mysterious lawless hand, God knows who's perhaps a, a profiteer or a private capitalist or of both. Be that as it may, the car is not going quite in the direction the man at the wheel imagines, and often it goes in an altogether different direction. I doubt very much whether it can truthfully be said that the communists are, are directing the heap. To tell the truth, they're not directing, they're being directed. The value of the labor force orders the wage. The foreign visitors are amazed at nothing, as much as at the wage differences between the educated and unskilled workers that in Russia are bigger as nowhere else in, in Western Europe. Next, we want to illustrate how the struggle not to let wages fall below the value of the labor force continued in Russia. There's a quote here. While the communists in the capitalist countries must support the wage demands, he cannot do so under proletarian dictatorship. Here, the economic demands of the workers must be reconciled with the development of the productive forces and the socialist accumulation. When the wage demands were raised in July 1926, none of the trade unions supported the demands. The Central Council of the Trade Unions could not support them because there had, had been a price increase since spring. Under these circumstances, the demands for a wage increase meant that the actual wage had to be adjusted when the price rose. But that would mean uh, official recognition of the decline in monetary value, and we couldn't comment on that. Yes. So any comments on this section here? Alan? I think this bit about the invisible hand gets at the back and forth that we've been having about you know, what's what's the difference if, if we have a taxation in value terms or in the communist state where we have, you know, the, the red bureaucracy? What's the difference? I think the difference is if value is operating, then we're controlled by this invisible hand. And the whole point of this is to get rid of any invisible hand and secret forces that are controlling humanity behind our backs. So no more invisible hand, just our own hands. No more invisible hands. There you have it, folks. I'd like to see some invisible hands. Reminds me of the joke. Anybody remember that joke? What's what's red and invisible? No, no tomatoes. Reminds me of that one. I always like that one. Yeah, I think it's a great quote by Lenin here. I think there's some like it's a kick-ass quote. The machine refused to obey the hand that guided it. It was like a car that was not going in the direction the driver desired. I doubt very much whether it can be truthfully said that the communists are directing that heap. To tell the truth, they are not directing, they are being directed. I think Alex put up his hand. It, it's a cracking course, I agree. But then they make the, the bold claim the value of the labour force is the invisible hand that's doing this, which Lenin doesn't claim. Lenin's kind of like, well, as he says, God knows what. Yeah, I think Lenin is wrong, to be honest with you. That's the way I'd say. But like, yeah, Lenin says God knows who. But I think that uh, Appel and them have it right by showing the importance of the wage form. Right, but, but that's power, just saying they haven't provided any evidence for it. Well, you, you could say that, but they're offering a logical argument. That's what I would say the book is. No, they're not. They're, they're, they're saying Lenin said that the economy was out of control. We think that the value of the labour force is a bad thing. Therefore, we, we know why the commodity is out of control. It, it just, uh, I, I don't see. Sorry, say that again. Say that again. Sorry, so I, I grab you again, Alex. 
So sorry, yeah. So the evidence they they got it. Lenin saying the economy is out of control, and then without any evidence, they say right. The cause of this is the value of the labour force. Yeah, I think that's their. It's you know, it's just a logical deduction they're making. You know, like logical deduction is just a statement. Well, I think they've making a. I think they're making quite an argument for it. Like no more than like you know, Marx making an argument for the you know value being a real abstraction operating what drives capitalism. He he builds an argument, you know. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, to be clear, there's nothing. None of their conclusions I disagree with. I just think their arguments for them are really poor. Well, fair enough. Fair enough. Each to her own, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> Browbeat anyone. <laughs> um, but so far. So far, yeah. Like I think yeah, maybe like, it all falls together, and the, the last jigsaw piece will like slot. Yeah, in. maybe. Yeah, it might be one of these as well. Like sometimes these arguments they accumulate, don't they? Okay, I think we'll go to the next bit. Kielcha, I said that we'd get you to read the last bit with all these boring statistics because you get your good, your, <laughs> your, your, your LibriVox voice going. How do you feel? Oh, sure. In 1921, the calculation according to value was introduced. The prices of goods rose. In 1921, the index of retail prices was 139. And in 1922, 98. Since the work of the worker had nothing to do with the wealth of the goods produced, wages lagged far behind price increases. As a result, there were major strikes to prevent the price of the labor force from falling too much below its value. These strikes were almost all wild strikes, and only in a few cases, to the great annoyance of the central unions, were supported by the local unions. The trade union organ, Vopra Citruda, 1924, number seven of eight, provides the following information on this subject, although the editorial staff notes that the statistics are not complete. In 1921, 477 strikes were carried out with 184,000 strikers. In 1922, there were 505 strikes with 154,000 strikers. 95% of the strikers belong to state enterprises. Of all these strikes, only 11 were supported by the unions. Dogadov then provided the following information at the 7th Trade Union Congress. In 1924, there were 267 strikes, 151 of them in state-owned enterprises. In 1925, there were 199 strikes, 99 of them in state-owned enterprises. The unions supported none of these strikes. The fact that the unions did not support these wage movements is, of course, because they were incorporated into the state apparatus. At the 11th Congress of the CPR, March to April 1922, trade unionist Andreev acknowledged the difficult material condition of the workers, but complained that the unions make excessive wage demands on the state and demand from it as much as possible. Andreev declared that various unions support the wage demands because former Mensheviks and social revolutionaries permeate the trade union apparatus. This was followed by a cleansing of the trade union apparatus. Production based on the value of the labor force determines that workers have nothing to do with the administration and management of production. From Russian experience, with the urgent necessity to increase labor productivity, to work lossless and to achieve profitability of each enterprise, inevitably leads to a certain contradiction of interests between the working masses and the directors heads of state, enterprises, or authorities to which these enterprises are subordinate in questions working conditions in the enterprise. Therefore, concerning with socialized enterprises, trade unions have an unconditional duty to defend the interests of the workers. This was indeed necessary because the Central Council of Trade Unions stated that the Supreme National Economic Council was not guided by the interests of the workers, but by the financial interests of the industry in the area of occupational health and safety. Truth 1928, number 31. This meant that the Supreme Economic Council did not provide sufficient funds for occupational health and safety in enterprises, but the Red Directors made it even better. They used only a small part of the seemingly scarce funds for occupational safety. They probably put the rest into the company. For example, the Trud. 1928, number 32, gives the following figures. The Ukrainian State Trust consumed 20%. It is therefore likely 
that 80% of the funds earmarked for health and safety at work were invested in companies. The Ural's Asbestos Trust consumed only 28%, the Dunagol 18.7%, the Yugo Steel 14.8%, and the Jushni Rudnit Trust only 4.9%. In fact, economic management. The consequences were inevitable. Accidents at work. Trud, 1928, number 159. Here we go. In the Donegal Trust, 1925, 18.7% of all workers had an accident. In 1926, it was 26.3%, or 18,821 men. In 1927, it rose to 25,749 men. The number of accidents in coal and steel industry, 1923, 11.5%. 1925, 18%. 1926, 25%. Finally, some data from the Trud, 1928, number 280. The number of accidents in mining, 1927 to 1928. October to December, 1927, 8.3%. January to March, 1928, 9.3%. April to June, 1928, 10%. The number of accidents, therefore, rose by around 1% each quarter. In the metal industry, the number of accidents in the same period was 6.8%, 7.1%, and 7.9% respectively. Here too, there was a regular increase. This is the regulating function of value and surplus value. So getting to some of the arguments we've kind of our discussion we've been having about what would be the difference between the bureaucracy and say the workers destroying the that idea of labor, power, a wage. We see there's two kind of general bits they're doing here. One is the bit where they're talking about health and safety. So if you have a bureaucracy who are deciding production and they have maybe deciding targets above the heads of workers and you have managers who have to implement those targets and are under pressure to do that when they have funds that are for the health and safety of the worker just like under capitalism they will try and basically cut the spending in those areas and put them into production and we see basically health and safety really falling going very bad in this time period there was such an emphasis on increasing of production that workers safety is essentially seen as a by the system is seen as a cost while for the workers that is not seen as a cost by the workers themselves in the point of production you have a different logic driving that you would not have that same phenomenon anybody want to discuss some of this stuff here now alan that that's all all correct what you just said there about you know accidents and all that going up obviously from the stats that were cited there but the other half of that is this happened even though the unions and the bureaucrats and so on didn't want it to happen it's not that they were being evil and twirling their mustaches saying we're going to accumulate more value but value did it all by itself that's why we got to get rid of value because it it operates how it wants to, not how any human involved wants it to. And Kilcher? I think this happened not during the the Civil War, but uh, during those really ambitious five-year plans to catch up with the West, to reindustrialize. So I feel like there's a certain amount of what's the word, insecurity in, in, in the Russian leadership and, 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 and that, that, that might not have been present if there was a wider revolution that led them to to push the economy to grow faster than, than was safe. I don't know if that was wise or, or but like you said, they, they, even then they didn't invest totally in, in, in health and, and safety the way they should have. What they did do was set totally unrealistic targets for growth for all of these industries. Yeah, like I think it's a combination of, you know, the material conditions, but also if workers had the, if, if you could imagine, you know, if it was a workers council and they had a certain percentage of stuff on the safety and workers, the workers would, would have, no incentive to not spend it on their own safety. So it's kind of like a combination of the system itself and the material conditions, probably making these excesses we're seeing here, these rises worse than they they would have been without those material conditions. Chris in the chat also said that the periods we're discussing here, the 26, 27 periods where these increases in accidents at work were actually happening during the NEP period. So before these hardcore five-year plans 
were even implemented. So that makes it, things even worse. There's also the first half of this four pages that we read there as well was was on about the unions got integrated into government and that the unions themselves weren't actually supporting the strikes of the workers. Like some fairly staggering statistics here. Between 1921 and 22, there were 982 strikes and only 11 were supported by the unions. Okay, so that's like literally around 1%. And then in 24 and 25, there was 466 strikes and the unions supported zero of them. So they're, they're like some very stark implications we see there of how under, say, the Soviet system, how it evolved was that the unions, while supposed to be, you know, a vehicle for the workers to maintain their or increase their standard of living, actually ended up being a tool for the implementation of the plan, it seems. So, you know, that they're quite staggering stats. Alex? Oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, staggering stats. I don't know if that's a necessarily a property of the Soviet Union, though, because you would find similar behaviour around the same time in, in Britain. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a problem with kind of unions in general. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like it's their interest to be that intermediary and there's a limit to how much they're you know, going to want to rail against that. Yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, I think the, especially the kind of guild type unions are particularly. Yes. That was different in England when there were much, there were much more broader based unions, I think, around the 1860s and 70s. You know, that the weren't associated with, with particular industries. And I think they were better, but then the, the guild type unions uh, kind of took over. And, yeah. Any other, anybody else? Uh, Illuminatus. I think that in certain situations, workers might very well consider safety measures as like costs. If you are like in a a situation of scarcity or danger, like, okay, we have like this wood and metal here and we could build some rail guards so people don't fall to their death somewhere. Or we could like build some Kalashnikovs because we could always have like another imperialist incursion into our like communist country. Or um, if it's like a matter of food scarcity or something, I could very well imagine workers deciding against safety measures so the available resources can be used for other stuff. Yeah, like that's fair enough. Yeah, who cares? Whatever the workers want to do. I would say though here that like the it wasn't the workers making these decisions. You know, it would have been the managers. Uh, yeah, yeah, of, were, of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Like, you know, I, I think in general, though, workers might complain about other different workers' councils spending their funds on their safety, but maybe not so much in their own ones, you know? They might say, oh, this health and safety madness, you know, but actually, you know, their own helmets that stop them like having a brick fall on their head. They're probably like going, and it's fair enough. My helmet is good. I can imagine some of that shit going on. Health and safety gone mad. Uh, okay. Fellow Jits, sir, would like to speak. Yeah, I want to comment on this a bit. I think there's always an exception to the rule, but this is not the interesting thing. The interesting thing is, is really what is the rule. And the rule is that production based on value of labor force determines that workers have nothing to do with the administration and management of production. And, and this is what, what they are writing about, that this is a rule. If you sell your labor force, then you have nothing to do with the product of your labor and you have nothing to do with the administration of your, of your work. So, and then, of course, the workers decide about their work and their consumption, and of course, also about the safety of their work. That there, there are some exceptions of the rule in, in which they have reasons for neglecting their safety. I think this is not an, not an argument against what they are writing here. Because they show that the rule is if the workers control the connection between work and product, then they control also the the conditions of their work. Yeah, thanks for that, Herman. So fellow Jitzer, we've we've identified who fellow Jitzer is. That's uh, Herman who translated the book. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's really well put. Herman's back again, yep. 
I have another point. I came a little bit late uh, to the session and there, there was one discussion about the red bureaucracy. And I think it's a very important point because of course you can say if, if the general social work is 100%, so if the tax rate is 100%, then you get the problem of red bureaucracy because then the, the connection, the direct connection between the work and the, the product of the work is delegated to the council organization, you can say. So, but what they discuss here in the book is in the first part, because before they come to the general social work, in the first part, they discuss the direct connection between work and work product. And if you imagine that there is 100%, take it for a moment, 100% connection of work and work product, then the workers absolutely control how much they work and how much they consume and the conditions of their work. So with the general social work, there is a need for the general social work and for the funds uh, which they have to deduct from their direct relation uh, between work and work product. But this comes later and I think this, this will be very tricky point to discuss because many people think that the higher stage of, of communism is if there is a general social work 100%. I would argue it's more the different. They must control the relation of work and work product. And the more they go into general social work, the more they delegate this and the more they risk to lose control of this direct relation. This is, I think, the main point of the book. Well, that's interesting. Why would they lose control over the product, do you think, if it's all 100%? If would they like, because they would still have control in the workplace, Herman. Yes, they they have they you can say they have still control in the workplace. They control their their local work and, and the conditions there, but they don't control uh, the numbers of hours they have to work, and the distribution of of their product. So if if there is a direct connection between work and work product, then everybody can say. I I want to work five hours a day, for example, and okay, I know yeah. what I can get for this because you have the uh, labor time calculation, which is open for everybody, and you, you can exactly plan your individual consumption and your individual work. But the more you transfer this to a general social work, of course, there are some reasons for this, health care, care for elderly and so on. We come later to this. But the more you transfer to this, the less you control how much you have to work. Then there is, is, is a bureaucracy or you can say a, a, a council organization which will say, OK, we, we have uh, planned this and this and this. And this means a 10 hour working day for you. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, OK, so who wants to read the final uh, little bit here? Alan, how do you feel about it? Sure. We want to leave it at that. For us, it is only a matter of seeing these things from a certain perspective. And here it is that in Russia, this procedure cannot be attributed to the malice of the Russian state administrators, but that it is a necessary consequence of a production in which the labor force appears as a commodity, regardless of whether the state buys this labor force or a private entrepreneur nor does it have anything to do with whether the surplus value is created for private individuals or for the state. The value performs its function of order. And then you have to say with Lenin, I doubt very much whether it can truthfully be said that the communists are directing that heap. To tell the truth, they are not directing, they are being directed. This idea here, the value performs its function of order. Like literally yesterday I was on YouTube and... I don't know what type of weird stuff I'd be looking at, but the, I was suggested this video of, <laughs> why am I saying this, of self-organizing circuitry. And so they, what they had is they basically had this, like a, a, a Petri type dish, a large one with some kind of oil in it. And they had ball bearings and some bits of iron in it. And what they did is they had them randomly just in, in the oil and they applied a, a, a current, some type of just a simple electrical current to the oil and 
no joke in you, all of a sudden, uh, the whatever energy was in that system caused the ball bearings and the, the iron filings to wire themselves up in a kind of like a biological cell structure. Like really, it would take like a minute or something, but it, they, whatever way the power flowed through the system, it causes self-organization. It was really amazing to see. But like here we have a similar thing where we have the value starts forming these, you know, performs this function of order. It's performing these functions that the drivers don't want necessarily. You know, maybe the capitalists do want them. But like, I don't think we make the case here that the Russians wanted like their workers to, you know, be dying or anything like this. You know, so we, we see this, you know, this emergent, these emergent things happening when you have the structure, the economic, political economic structure set up in a certain way. It will order life in a certain way. Now, Jan Appel and the GIC are in this book are making the case that it is this wage relation that is key. That the destruction of the wage is the fundamental underlying thing that will allow value to essentially be destroyed, you know, capitalist type value relations and those ordering functions that they uh, perform. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar. Mm-hmm.